Okay, let's dim the, that's going. All right, hi everybody. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, just a little thing, I'm used to giving technical presentations, but this is my first creative one, so I'm a little bit nervous, but we'll get through it, it'll be fine. Yeah, so let's get started. So uh, let me just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Maya, I'm a developer and technical artist. I'm a freelancer who works on a bunch of different projects. Um, that's not me, that's the game I'm working on at the moment. Um, Necrobarista is a 3D visual novel set in magical realist Melbourne in a cafe run by a necromancer. It's good stuff, look at us up, we've got a demo at PAX, so yeah, gotta do a plug. And um, yeah, so that's not me, but this is kind of me at the moment, how I'm feeling. Um, I just want to say up front, so yeah, I am very much a developer and um, not a professional animator. I'm a, I animate for a hobby and I think it's fun and I've learned some valuable lessons from it that I apply in my game making. So I just want to kind of like set the tone for this talk that, um, yeah, like, It'll be good. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit wiped, but I'll warm up, it'll be fine. Um, yeah, so there was a lot to do for this talk and trying to make animations to like show stuff and not just talk about it, but uh, unfortunately um, that kind of happens. So occasionally if you see a GIF like that, that means just imagine there was a cool animation demonstrating the principle there, but Cool, so let's go on. All right, so just a little overview. Um, uh, with this talk, just so you have some context to know what you're up for when you're going in, uh, I'm gonna be using these 12 principles that I mentioned as kind of like a jumping off point to talk about a bunch of things. I'm gonna be generally summarizing them, um, but also most of the content is like, uh, just kind of some little things I've learned around the way, a bit of a like, grab bag and um, yeah, kind of like going on a wander through some thoughts about animation in games. And um, this talk is primarily aimed at programmers, um, understanding that uh, you know generally like games programming, have like made a game before, but maybe like don't know a whole lot about animation. Um, and yeah, so I'm hoping that uh, what I hope you get out of this, just in overall, is that um, by learning some kind of like basic animation principles, you'll have a vocabulary that you can use with your artists and animators on your team if you have them to like be able to better communicate stuff. So when you're like, oh, hey, that attack animation is kind of weird looking. Can you like, I don't know, make it 20% cooler or whatever? <laughs> Rather than getting that, you can be like, oh yeah, can you like bump up the follow through a little on that? Or like, oh, anticipation's like a little bit hard to go. Can you like give that some pizzazz? Um, I'm also be doing a little bit of like talking about some underlying theory and stuff. Um, that's more from, I have a little bit of a background in like um, signal processing. So I occasionally will go down weird maths holes. Um, but it's, it's, it's useful stuff and yeah, maybe get some things out of it. So um, here, I assuming you know what like tweening and eases are, if you don't know what tweening is, like please go and look it up. You'll get like a lot out of it. Um, it like makes so much stuff easier and nicer in games. Um, but I'm kind of using that as a jumping point for talking about like, oh yeah, when you're doing stuff with tweens and eases, like here's useful things. So uh, hopefully that. Yeah, I, uh, assuming you know basic algebra and 3D maths, um, just things like using vectors, like what a polynomial function is. Um, if you don't, that's fine. Um, there'll be some stuff that you should go look up because it's helpful. And yeah, I assume that you're a game developer who's, you know, at least made a game and so can relate to that process, which I hope everyone, or at least most people here have done that. Cool? All right. All right, so let's start with some context. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, if you're a developer, why should you learn about animation? Well, um, animation as an art form 
uh, isn't just about like, you know, dealing with timelines and like rigs and Maya and so on. Animation as an art form is basically studying how do you make move look good. And um, if you're a developer working on games, you spend a lot of time writing code that makes things move. And so rather than trying to like reinvent the wheel, it's good to go like study some basic animation principles so when you are making things move, you can make move good. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I said before, if you do work with animators in your team, it can, as with all things, when you're working in the collaborative process, having a little bit of an insight into other people's fields helps you work together better. Um, and that's not just from being able to communicate, but things like uh, often when we're working with designers and animators, we're making um, systems for things like player controllers or like uh, procedural animation or stuff like that, where we have to provide hooks for them to expose so that they can have the like expressivity they need to get the look they're going for. And um, knowing some basic animation principles like helps you with that process so you can like, oh, go uh, think of things to expose you might not have otherwise, or also know like which kind of things can be more important than others. So you're not just like, oh yeah, I just exposed like a thousand different variables. Here you go, here's a million sliders, uh, have at it. So yeah, that's why I think should learn a little bit. And also, maybe you'll like it. That's kind of what happened to me. Like I started doing it as a hobby because I think it's good to have a hobby that you're not very good at but enjoy. And um, then after a few years of having it be my thing that I go to be not very good at so I don't have to stress about it, I think I ended up being like kind of okay mediocre. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. And also, if you are an animator in the room, I apologize for my like programmer art, but I, um, it's still hopefully learning some lessons. And yeah, speaking of, why should you trust my opinions? Um, well, really, you shouldn't. Like I said, I'm not a professional animator, but I have um, been making games for 15 years now. Um, I've released like, oh gosh, probably almost two dozen. Um, and I've learned some things along the way. I've worked with animators a lot. Um, as like a technical artist, a lot of my job is doing things like uh, working with uh, artists and animators on like export scripts from Maya and so on, and like tools in like Unity or whatever to like help them get that control. So I've, I've had some, even though <laughs> on the actual art part, I'm, I'm kind of okay when I'm talking about like the working with art in a programming context, I, I you know, I, I think I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but also, for kind of the basis of this talk, um, yeah, you, like, probably shouldn't just trust what I'm saying. I'll have examples to compare that hopefully demonstrate themselves. But also, the, the core of this talk is summar basically summarizing the opinion of experts who know of a heck of a lot more than I do. So, yeah, trust the nine old mouse men, which, who are they? So yeah, what's these 12 principles and, and who's the what's it's? Um, so the kind of like basis for this talk is there's a very well-known um, book on animation called uh, Disney Animation, The Illusion of Life. Uh, it was written by, um, uh, well, two authors who were basically uh, interviewing the uh, head animators at Disney, um, which effectively they'd been working there since the 30s and uh, when they were kind of getting old and looking at retiring, they were like, oh shit, we should like write down this stuff so that like we can pass on our lessons to the next generation and not just have it die off. And um, yeah, they wrote this book called The Illusion of Life, which the sort of central part of it is that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, yeah, these like 12 principles, which were like very, most part, like high level conceptual like ways of thinking about and looking about like animation, making things move, how to make movement that looks and feels good. And uh, yeah, it's like if you find this talk interesting and you'd like to know more, like go read the book itself. There's like so much more in there than I could possibly cover in a talk, so yeah. All right, so the 12 principles are these. Um, I'm not gonna read them all out because we'll be going through them, but just to give you an idea. Um, this is the order they appear in in the book, and um, in the book they're kind of in order of importance from the perspective of the author. I, uh, 
kind of coming at this from a different context, I have a little bit different opinion about uh, what a good order would be, so um, I'm going something a little bit more like this. So, yeah, the numbers might be out of order, but it's the same things, just I've got a different bit of kind of thread I'm going through. Cool, all right. Um, so yeah, I, I mostly, I've got 12 things to get through, so I'm just kind of gonna be hammering away on those. Let's get started. All right, the first one is slow in, slow out. Ah, that's, videos aren't looping apparently. That's, hmm, that should be okay. So what do we mean by this? Uh, for the context of games, like I said before, uh, this is just starting with a simple one. If you don't know about tweens and eases, like use them and get them, get them in your game. It's good stuff. It like adds so much more like liveliness with like very little uh, work for you. Uh, but also, if you if you already are familiar, just like a lot of people just use the defaults, don't look like into like the all the configurability and that and so on. So like look at the different eases you have available. Get to know them. Like play with them. Get for the feel so that like you kind of know where they are. All right, so some theory on this. All right, so <clears throat> with eases, what does slow in and slow out mean? Basically, the concept behind that principle is that mass acceleration and inertia affect everything, right? Uh, if you're familiar with like Newtonian equations of motion, um, displacement is a quadratic. That means it moves in a parabola, so um, objects, like instantaneous acceleration isn't really a thing in reality, apart from like weird situations. So like objects that are moving will have an acceleration phase and then a deceleration phase. So things will mo start moving slowly and then end moving slowly and fast in the middle. And that's why um, in-out quadratic is usually the default ease in easing libraries. So yeah, um, it's useful to like remember that there are like reasons for why, like, I guess this is why I put it up first, is a lot of this stuff, even if it's talking from like an art perspective, there is like real mathematical, like, observations of reality behind like a lot of these principles, which I won't necessarily always have the time to explain. But uh, another point here is that is if you are making things move and like working with creating worlds essentially, um, like knowing some like how the real world works, learning some physics. Um, this is just like high school level, but a little bit of other stuff is useful too. And uh, even if you just go like, oh, well, I don't need to know physics because the game I use, like the engine I use has a physics engine, so whatever, that can just do the physics for me. It's still useful to know this stuff, just so you have like that underpinning. And um, the same with like having simple, knowing some simple calculus enough to like integrate and differentiate um, polynomials will help a lot with your movement code. Um, because a lot of that is dealing with, yeah, functions that go along those lines. And rather than just kind of like eyeballing or guessing things, like if you're quick enough on it that you can just go like, oh yeah, sure, like this is that, so I can just calculate and get the derivative, and there's my velocity, bam. So uh, if you're not already on that, I recommend reading. <sighs> okay. So um, yeah, something important is that uh, slow in and slow out doesn't just apply to movement. Think of it with like all the kind of like motion that you do. Motion means more than just like literally moving an object. Things like uh, rotation and scaling, obviously, but also things like uh, deformation. If you're doing stuff like um, uh, doing like uh, blend shapes or between faces or things like that, anytime that you have things that are causing <laughs> causing the image to change, you know, like moving, even if it's not like gross object motion. Um, ooh. I'm sorry to call your objects gross, I just mean in aggregate. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like, it's important to think about these principles and not just apply them at the top level, but like kind of take that process down through all the things you're doing. Yeah, okay. All right. Next principle is straight ahead and pose to pose. Um, in this book, uh, this is mainly told in the context of like literally like drawing frames of animation and about like how you do that, like how you make different kinds of motion look good when you are literally like taking a pencil and drawing on slides. Um, but even though that stuff is there, there's um, some like 
useful uh, thoughts and underpinnings behind the process they do use. And uh, putting it in like game development terms, uh, the principles there are basically about uh, extrapolation versus interpolation, right? Which is dynamics versus kinematics. Um, so when I say dynamics, what we usually mean with that in games is physics simulation. <clears throat> and interpolation is, well, either literally interpolation, but also things like having actual like uh, hand animated stuff when you've got timelines and curves and so on, that kind of thing. And there's a balance between the two. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that. So yeah, um, just like, oh, well, we could animate this, but I'll just like take these and you know, just run them through the physics system. That'll automatically make it amazing magic, right? Uh, no, like often I find um, in games you can often spend like way more time trying to like tweak your simulation parameters, get your physics to be stable and not jittering off and you know, if this isn't looping, so I'll have to be doing shit like that. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, useful to like actually consider the trade-offs um, because really what you're dealing with is, um, it's not that like physics isn't automatically better or worse and hand animate isn't automatically better or worse. Um, really the trade-off is about reactivity versus stylability. So physics is reactive, it can respond to all sorts of things and respond in ways that you haven't necessarily thought of. Whereas um, having like uh, interpolation from hand stuff is, is very stylable because you can get either yourself or artists on your team and so on to like expressly define like these are all the things that are happening. And excuse me, uh, they're both like really awesome at different kinds of things. Uh, but you don't necessarily like have to be all or nothing. So um, this slides, uh, this pic is like a capture from a really neat talk from a technical artist who worked on Uncharted 4. Excuse me. And uh, it's talking about how they did um, the hair simulation on their characters. And the thing is like when they were scoping stuff out and so on as you know, really talented programmers who at a super cool studio like Naughty Dog who are renowned for doing amazing feats of technology, uh, they start off with like, oh yeah, what if we do some kind of like, like strand spring system that's like going through and like configurable stiffness maps and so on and all this and that and like, uh, well they were kind of like trying to, some of the team were trying to concept that out and work out what the system would be um, another technical artist just went learned like, well, we need something in the game for now just to like play around with. Uh, so I'll just like hand this over to the artists and just get them to make four different blend shapes for like hair went up, hair went down, hair went left, hair went right. And then just like have like a single value physics simulation for it that just blends between those. Um, then when that went in, everyone went, oh shit, that's actually like perfectly fine, that looks great, let's just ship it. So like, uh, I guess my point is, it's, it's useful to like combine these methods and think about what's appropriate where. Because uh, often what can be really useful is having like that, um, that like, real, like handcrafted artistic input that you're using to essentially like define the extents of like, these are the kind of things that should be possible, right? So like for here, you're like literally making, like if you want to talk mass, it's like a vector space kind of thing where you've got axes defining the limits, but <laughs> um, uh, defining those limits by hand with artists helps make sure you don't end up with like any like weird explosive stuff because like all the possibilities are kind of defined out there. But then within that space, you can have um, like a physics simulation that's much simplified so it's a lot easier to configure, um, like you don't have any like weird stuff coming out of it and then you use that to drive like the animation of like an interpolation system. Um, yeah, there's a link there to the video which like this is just a tiny bit of it and there's a whole bunch of cool stuff in there so I recommend checking it out. Uh, so putting that another way, um, yeah you can also rather than using simulation to drive your interpolation, you can use interpolation to drive your simulation. Um, for example, uh, when you have um, 
bodies that you do want to be like physically simulated that are responding to things and so on, then like um, I often see a situation where we go like, well, since like it has to be dynamic and responsive, like uh, we'll just have to physically physically simulate anything. I'll just make like a little uh, controller script that just like looks at your velocity and speeds you up or slows you down until you get to the thing, and then that's a little bit off, so oh, I'll like adjust it a bit, and then you end up like halfway to writing a PID controller, which I don't know if you've ever done like um, robotics in the real world, but like that's a non-trivial thing. <laughs> um, when really a lot of the time is just like you could have done it with a tween, just like rather than tween the position, like tweening your velocity or acceleration. Because um, if you go back to what I was saying about knowing calculus, it's very easy to go like, well, um, I want to go from like maintain this speed and accelerate over this time. So I just like, um, you know, integrate that to get like the quadratic that'll like add up to that and um, just run that as a tween. And you know what's going to eventually sum up to that without like any having to like kind of manage at every step along the way. And then the good thing about that is um, if you're dealing with things like, for example, you have a game where you have a lot of like, I don't know, actors moving around, like cars driving and stuff and so on, they're mainly just kind of like doing their own thing. Um, but you need them to be physically simulated because like at any moment, you know, they could, the, the player could come along and bump into them and send them whatever. And um, having that like changeover from like uh, being kind of externally controlled through like um, tweens or whatever, because like for all sorts of reasons that, yeah, like not basically writing, writing an AI for every character can be difficult. But um, if you're having like your control happening in effect to be like a higher derivative from position, then um, it's like really easy to just take over to completely physics space is you just stop the tween and it'll just like continue with the same physical properties it had. It's just no longer having that driven by a um, like interpolation system. It's just now simulated. So yes. Um, and all, as always, like uh, this kind of stuff, in order to have predictable results, you have to manage your time step, um, which hopefully you know. But yeah, like if you're doing all this kind of simulation stuff in like your uh, non-fixed delta time, um, this is like numerical integration is a thing. And if you're changing your like slice value, you get really, really off. So yeah, don't do it. Use fixed time step. <laughs> all right, arcs. So, um, sorry, excuse me. This is like kind of following on a little bit and it's like the calculus thread here, which is, but for a little bit, bit of a break on aesthetic is just, uh, as we said, physics is quadratic, quadratic functions follow parabolas. In general, everything arcs. Um, anything that's affected by gravity will have an arc to its motion. Um, kind of because of this, um, uh, moving in like a arc rather than just a line, even if you're doing like all we said before about using easing and so on, having that little bit of like extra hop to it can just make everything like feel more lively and nice and organic. And even if it's very subtle, like this is, excuse me, like a very noticeable kind of hopping in, but it's, uh, yeah, good to like add that kind of like nice, ah, ooh, pizzazz. So when dealing with arcs, um, usually you're thinking about two different kinds, uh, either parabola or circular arcs. Um, usually using parabolas, because like I said, um, physics, quadratics. But uh, circular arcs are also nice for just being able to, like it has a different look to it, so it's an artistic choice, so something that you should probably expose. And um, when thinking about arcs, uh, rather than, uh, it can often be a problem of like trying to actually like uh, do the motion in like all kind of the arc in one thing, but it's a lot better to instead like break it down into its component axes. So we see here we have like a little quadratic arc with my head hopping back and forth. And um, as you can see by this, it's just um, like if you're adding up the uh, motion of, it's just a horizontal linear tween and a vertical like quadratic tween and you get a nice quadratic arc, and that's a lot easier to like manage and configure 
and expose variables for than actually like trying to define a curve. Um, so yeah, parabolas will be a linear on the x and quadratic on the y and yeah, circular-ish. If you just make them both quadratic, it's kind of close enough. If you want to be exact, you'd have to use like sine, but whatever, usually quad quadratic just looks fine. Um, yeah, here's a little bit of code. It's a nifty little like rough unity-ish pseudocode of a function that um, just does like a procedural arc using cross product to get the like perpendicular vector to do that like composing the arc from two separate planes. And yeah, there's like not all that much to it. Um, like it's pretty simple and just having stuff like that to kind of not just always using like your base motion, but composing them together and doing that in a nice, easily exposed way um, just makes it really easy to quickly like add a bit of life to stuff. Okay, squash and stretch. Mm, a little bit how I felt this morning. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, uh, squash and stretch. Like, this is usually the one that people are most familiar with. Um, it's the first one in the book, and it's kind of like a very, very important principle there that like runs as a thread through the whole thing. Um, I kind of put it later because like I've got a different thread going. But uh, essentially like um, everything has some amount of like distortion to it as it moves. Like when you're impacting something, squishing as you move along, stretching out along the way. Um, and it's not just cartoons, like using it subtly, even if you like more realistic, um, just having that subtle effect like gives it a little bit more oomph. Um, it's also useful because it's an easy way that you can essentially convey material properties to something, right? Just through its movement without having any other kind of stuff. So for here we have, you can just look at that and go, oh, the thing up top is like soft and the thing down the bottom is hard, you know? One of them's rubber, one of them's like plastic or something. Um, thinking about that kind of like, uh, yeah, that like ability to express something about an object through its movement is useful and stretch and squatch is a really easy way to do that. It's um, a little bit goes a long way. Um, you don't always have to be like super exaggerated. And uh, it can also really help because like uh, often when you have like some animation you need for something or whatever, just like a little bit of stretch and squash can often do good enough without actually having to involve like a real animation or something, or like adding just a little bit of it to uh, something that isn't quite like popping like you want can bump it up. So um, for like the very little effort that's involved, it's like quite a high, you know, effort to return to value uh, thing to do. So, all right, let's get on to anticipation. So what do we mean by anticipation in the context of animation is um, effectively like uh, preempting a motion with another motion that um, either helps to reinforce the, the look that you're going for or like help um, draw attention to something that might otherwise be missed. So um, yeah, if you add a movement as a wind up before the kind of main part of the motion, that's a really useful tool to help like um, you can either uh, change the context, like add kind of, uh, like, like do you want it to be like more forceful or more not? And without actually changing the movement itself, what you do as the lead up part has like a big effect on like um, the kind of what you convey about the thing for it. And um, I can also like stacking them together is good. So having like an ant uh, anticipation to an anticipation to anticipation. Um, if you like really want to sell something. Um, cool. And uh, it's a powerful way to control attention. Um, gun bate, everyone. Um, uh, as something I'll go into it later is that like when you're thinking about movement, the fact that people's attention is a limited resource and they only have so much ability to process um, what they're looking at um, affects a lot. And so using anticipation to draw eyes towards something that you're, that where something's about to happen um, is a really powerful tool because essentially it means that you can um, use like faster 
lot like shorter, faster, subtler actions that otherwise you wouldn't really be able to pick up. But if you have like a good anticipation to it that kind of prepares the viewer for it to happen, um, they'll catch stuff that they would otherwise miss and it's, yeah, it's useful. Um, but you just have to make sure that if you are doing it for that purpose, that the anticipation doesn't actually end up like distracting from the thing itself. So you usually want the anticipation to be just like whatever your kind of subtlety level of the main thing is, make it the end, uh, it like a little bit less or like if it is more, then give it enough kind of like space in, in time between them that it's not like just overwhelming. <laughs> All right, so timing. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna be talking about in timing is kind of what I was saying about a little bit about there, about <clears throat> um, to do with uh, perception and like breaking down motion, which is a time thing. Anyway, I'll just get into it. So uh, the same motion, like played at a different duration, can actually quite change the emotional impact of something. Um, it can kind of change how you interpret it. Something that looks like a, um, just like a kind of, Calm, swaying can look like frantic or so on. That uh, sounds kind of obvious, but like, yeah, anyway. Don't forget to change the mood with time and not just the actual motion itself. Uh, so an important concept is timing is um, something, sorry, this is where signal processing stuff comes in. So um, in signal processing world, there's this concept of something called the Nyquist frequency. And essentially, um, if you have a limited sample rate on a signal, then the highest frequency that, that those samples can capture is um, half of your sample rate, which is essentially that you need two samples to be able to perceive a signal, which in animation means you need at least two frames to be able to see something. Uh, what this comes out is, if you're thinking about your frame rate uh, that your game is running at, um, keep in mind that there is very much like a hard limit of the fastest possible thing you can see. Um, and this doesn't always come up. Um, but if you're especially doing things like, uh, a lot of games might do stuff like, um, for optimization purposes, oh, we've got a lot of units on screen. So like, we won't actually sample their animation at 60 FPS. We'll just do it like 15 or 10 or something. And then if you haven't sort of kept that in mind when like working your animations and so on, you could end up effectively like, uh, reducing the sample rate is kind of like doing a low pass filter, uh, which is, which, Anyway, sorry, <laughs> getting into signals again. But essentially, you can be like losing information that you're expecting to have just by the fact that you're like, um, even though you're like uh, doing your blending or whatever, if you're not actually sampling it at that frequency, it can get lost. So it's important to think about. All right, so follow through and overlapping motion. <clears throat> So in the context of what we're talking about here, um, oh, actually, oop. so what we mean by follow through is, um, oh, come on, why aren't you leaping? There we go. Uh, follow through is that when, yeah, when you have like something attached to something else, right? Then um, when you move the thing, the things attached to it will move after the thing they're attached to, and when it stops, the things attached to it will continue. That's ooh, easier to show. So essentially, it's thinking about hierarchy of motion, that when you're moving something, there's kind of like a primary part that's like the root of the motion, and then kind of spreading out from that, there is a um, kind of like thinking about like, like lag in time and so on. Um, so uh, when, oh gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, drag is the, oh, sorry, I'm messing up this slide. But um, overlapping action is that, um, like, when you have multiple things happening at once, uh, staggering the, their timing, um, like, kind of helps uh, add a lot more expressivity and so on. So that's either something like here, where we have a whole group of things. Um, but also, for example, if you're moving a character or something, having, like, a slight little bit of delay between, say, moving the left leg and right leg, or like upper body and lower body and so on, um, adds like a real nice organic naturalness to it. So having that kind of like combined with before, that thinking about hierarchy of like which part of this is moving 
Um, and that's kind of what goes first. And then everything else follows on outwards from there, a kind of at their own little bit of time difference. Um, really helps like sell an effect. Okay. So uh, secondary action. Uh, what this means in the context here is like, getting on, uh, having a, when you have a primary motion that you're going for, which like, for example, here we have like the bird pecking, um, having a secondary action that's not part of it, but kind of responding to it can uh, really like reinforce, emphasize at the context. Um, a great thing for it here is like, um, facial expressions or gestures or stuff like that. Um, so for example, even it's just a simple thing, but like adding the blinking in response um, helps like imply a bit more force, gives it a bit more liveliness, <laughs> makes it a little bit funnier. And it's good to think about this in the context of like, um, it might not necessarily be literally moving anything. Like here, I'm just like switching out some frames, but having uh, animation um, allowing for like affecting a couple other things to go with it is important to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so exaggeration. What we mean, oh yes. Uh, so I'm gonna go on a little bit of a ta tangent and talk about the immersive fallacy. So this is a concept that um, a lot of games are, there's this kind of like attitude of stri striving for realism and seeing like uh, realistic simulation as the ultimate goal. And really, um, it's important to remember that like, uh, like the game is in the difference from reality. If you had a perfect game that was a perfect simulation of reality, it wouldn't be a game, it would be me like standing on a stage being a little bit hungover and that's not super great. I'd rather have like the pretty lies that mean I can have all the energy in the world and that's what video games are for. So like, um, Kind of bringing that into animation, what I mean is that uh, it's very much a thing that what uh, looks real often isn't actually real, and if you have like literally realistic motion, it can often feel fake. Um, you see this a lot with things like uh, gravity in games. Often having it as like actually 9.8 meters a second squared, like just feels weird, and games will mess with it. And um, this is a real thing that's like. There's science backing it up. I have a link to, it was actually, I wasn't even like researching for this talk. I was just like watching SIGGRAPH talks while eating dinner, whoops. And uh, came across this paper that was uh, using like uh, techniques for like very, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of different fluid simulation techniques, not from like a performance perspective, but from like, uh, how people perceive their reality. And um, it was interesting that they, uh, yeah, found that um, if you provided a reference video of like a literal video of a tank of water moving around and then the simulation of the same thing happening, uh, the ones that people said looked the most realistic was like completely different from if you just gave them those same simulations but without the real reference. And like people's interpretation of reality isn't really reality because we're biased beings. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's important to like think about rather than necessarily like slavishly devoting yourself to capturing actual objective reality, think about the subjective reality of like uh, be true to how something feels and be true to like kind of how you perceive it rather than necessarily how it literally works. And yeah, this is make everything 20% cooler is what the science says. Um, one little thing is, uh, so like this is a frame from animation way back and um, uh, when you are exaggerating motion, um, the less time that the th thing is appearing on screen, the more exaggeration, exaggeration you can do for kind of like the same perceived effect. So um, this happens a lot if you go and look at something like, well, obviously from this book, uh, Disney movies or like, um, uh, like other kinds of animation and stuff and something will look like pretty much normal and fine and so on, but then you like pause on a frame and you're like, whoa, what the heck is that? Like what's going on there? This is like super distorted and weird and so on. Um, when everything is like 
going through, you're not looking at the individual frames. And the overall effect is quite different, like in motion rather than individually. So um, yeah, you often need to like, for, for the same amount of effect, like bump stuff up a lot if it's short, basically. All right. <clears throat> so staging. Uh, this is going to go on another slight little bit of tangent. But um, yeah, in games are, for the most part, a screen media. And like, there is, you know, a century of research on framing things on screens and, you know, the art of camera pointing. And if you're doing something like writing a camera controller, which is essentially teaching a computer how to point cameras at things, uh, it's good to go and like study some like composition or uh, basic cinematography and that kind of stuff. Because there's a lot of knowledge out there that even just the basic principles of um, can really help you when you're applying that in like a programmatic approach. And yeah, I'm an anime nerd, I'm sorry. Um, there's a link there to a good uh, YouTube channel uh, called Every Frame of Painting that's kind of like pop cinematography analysis and um, it's neat if you want to start. Okay, so in the context of the principles, when we say staging, uh, we're talking less about composition and more about effectively uh, managing attention. So people's vision is, in terms of literally the space that you can look at, is much narrower than people usually think. Um, you can really only see like a very small uh, kind of cone through your eyes, and the rest is just your brain filling in the gaps. Um, there's some like neat experiments that have been done with this with eye tracking and so on, where you do something like have people read a page of text and like literally just changing the words a few words behind after they've read them, people don't even realize that it's text until they look up the top and that, sorry, they realize that it's different until they look up the top and go like, wait, this is a totally different page. Because uh, all like the area around here, your brain is just like filling in the gaps with. Um, and it's important to remember that in games because when you have a lot of distraction going on, then uh, it's like really easy to miss stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, so you should be thinking about where your players are looking uh, thinking about how much they kind of have to like sort through and process and that's a resource so you should be managing it. Put a burn on it. So yes, uh, important actions need their own space. Um, having things that are competing with that can draw attention away and mean uh, that it might be missed. Um, and it's important to think it's, they kind of need their own space both in literal space and also in time. So allowing kind of like gaps between the fluff and like the important things uh, can like really help it both on players not missing things and also just on making it like easier to follow and like less work to kind of, you know, not be like <laughs> stressed out and exhausted from playing Wes Waldo for three hours in your game. Um, and what was I? Uh, yeah, so like a lot of the techniques that have gone up to this point have been mentioning about like managing attention, drawing gaze and that kind of stuff. And even the ones I haven't, like a lot of them are really useful, kind of like applying that and using it to like, yeah, manage people's attention, get them to look where you want, and also like get them to be able to process and appreciate the things you're doing. Okay, so solid drawing. I'm, I'm not a solid drawer. <laughs> but, what this means in the context of the book is rather than solid as in good, we mean solid as in 3D. And essentially this is about, remember, um, like think about depth and mass and volume. Um, even when you're working in 2D animation, um, if you're always like sticking to literally 2D, like I see this um, in some games sometimes where they have like a 2D like character rig kind of like spine or something and it's just got like fixed joints that are always the same length and it just looks really super unnatural and so on because they're like literally keeping everything in like a single plane. And so yeah, even when you're doing 2D animation, like allow for stuff to have some volume and mass and depth to it and you'll open up a lot more like expressivity. Yeah, cool. So appeal. Um, what we mean with for appeal in the context of this is, uh, it doesn't mean like literally something that is nice, it's more like, uh, it's 
click. Oh, that's a really good whatever. Oh, I remember that. That's impactful, whatever. So like uh, appeal might be like a, a really appealing, I don't know, garbage pile might be like, yeah, that's like really nasty. That's, oh, that's selling it, you know? Um, and essentially, to summarize it, it's like for every, for every character you have, every entity, everything you're doing, it's an op opportunity to effectively like characterize them, to give them some appeal. Um, uh, even if it's just like, you know, before we had just like UI buttons and you can think about like, what is the, what is like the character of these buttons? Are like, are they like jaunty and happy and fun? Or are they kind of like cool and sleek and like, ooh, yeah, in. Um, and like thinking about this and going through the process and like um, being kind of like deliberate with like what you're trying to express and how you do it. Um, like really pays off a lot and um, like a simple rule of thumb for that is to think about like what defines them, like what, what kind of like their uniqueness and to take that aspect and emphasize it. So um, here's my <laughs> little art process. The one on the left was my original drawing for myself that I did that was like, yeah, I want to kind of go for like, I'm kind of sleepy and happy and it's like simple, that's good. And I was like, yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, but then I, you know, tried to put my money where my mouth is and go through the process and say like, okay, right. So like, what am I kind of like trying to express here? What defines this? And I'm like, well, uh, I was kind of going for like a sleepy look. So like the eyes are an important part of that. So I should just like really emphasize those like droopy bags there and like bring them up so it's really nice and visible. And then I'll just like simplify the hair geometry because that's not really important and bring the mouth down. And then I'm going for like a scruffy kind of thing. So let's add in some little hair curls and just a couple changes and it's like, oh wait, yeah, that's like way better. Okay, cool. Um, do that with your, with your movement. So let's wrap it up. <clears throat> uh, yeah, in case you couldn't tell, my kind of like nefarious agenda here is that uh, games can really, and game developers can really benefit from learning lessons from other fields and media. There's a whole lot of like really deep, really like, yeah, hard won knowledge and like insightful uh, lessons that can be learned and um, that might be more applicable than you might think. Um, and because of like the internet and Wikipedia and, you know, like buying ebooks for super cheap, um, it's super easy to access and you can totally just like go and get a like foundational book on animation and go like, yeah, I'll just like give this a read over a weekend. And then, oh, I kind of have like a basic working knowledge of simple animation now. That's useful. I can apply it. Um, so yeah, my kind of like thing is to like go searching through other fields outside of games for things that you might find interesting. Um, not just creative fields. I mean, here I was talking about a bunch of maths and signal processing that I like, which like still comes up in ways that you wouldn't quite expect. And it's also that like diversity of knowledge, yeah, <laughs> it, it multiplies. It, it grows more than like linearly. Um, even if you're like going for being really good at one thing, like I really want to be a really good game developer. If you take some time from just going um, like deep on that and like broaden yourself out a bit, you'll find that it can be for the same amount of effort, um, help you a lot more than you might think. So yeah, um, I just want to have like a little caveat here and say that uh, these principles, they're not commandments. Um, they're just like one school of thought, one that's very popular and like comes up a lot through like Western media, of course, because the influence of Disney. Um, and it's useful, but as always, like knowing the rules can help you get the most out of breaking them when you do. Um, so like it's totally fine to like play with this, to mess around, do other things. Um, and also it's important to uh, work with and talk to creative types around you because like um, uh, this is all well and good, but like uh, if your animator comes up and is like, oh, well, actually we shouldn't do this because of that. Um, don't be a jerk and go like, oh, well, I read a, one book and so therefore no more, no more than you. But <laughs> I'm sure you won't be doing that. But anyway, basically like 
talk to people and you'll like learn a lot as well. And yeah, um, so thank you for listening. Does uh, anyone have any questions? No? Uh, yes? Ah, uh, it's, it's, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, um, like, I'm not very good at it, so I'm kind of, it's unfortunate that it's like, oh, I can't really see half the game, but then I'm just going and watching up the later bosses on YouTube, because just, holy shit, yeah. Anyway, yeah. As a programmer with an interest in art and animation, um, how much art does tech, tech artists actually do? Um, what was it? Art? So yeah, here's the thing. Um, it seems like every like different company or person I talk to like kind of means something different by a tech artist, um, and it usually flips between. Usually, when they say tech artist, they either mean like an artist who knows some programming and can like work with like tools for bringing their art into stuff, or they mean like a programmer who like has some familiarity with art and so can. It's both ways are kind of like bridging that gap. I'm much more on the side that like I am very much a primarily a developer, um, but like I enjoy and try to like learn more about art so that I can do a better job of like working with artists on the teams, um, doing things like like uh, helping with pipeline and like tools for design and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm mean that way, and I guess it's like kind of up to which way you want to be. You can be either, and both are good. Sure. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone.